Well, welcome everybody. Welcome to this, the first of our Southwest Wings um, summer um, season of speakers. Well, today would have been the very first day of our 2020 summer festival. Jesus Christ. And um, yes, yeah, sadly, of course, we had to cancel it. But we decided it would be a great idea to um, offer a chance to some of our free program speakers to give an online Zoom presentation. So that's what um, that's what we're all doing. So um, this is uh, I'm I'm Chris Harbard and Mary Sia here. We're two of the board members of Southwest Wings. Hi, folks. Welcome. <laughs> and we've tried to put together what will be a series of talks for you each month which we hope that you'll be enjoying. Now we're particularly pleased to be able to introduce our speaker for today, Rick Wright. He will be familiar to many of you who've been to previous um, festivals as both a speaker um, and a, a trip leader as well. And um, he's a, an author, he's a tour leader for Victor Emmanuel Nature Tours, and we're very, very glad to have him with us. He used to live in Tucson, but now he's across in New Jersey in the Far East, where I'm sure it's a lot cooler there today than it is here. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Rick. And if you have any questions at all, um, you can send them to us through the Q&A um, uh, um, feature. feature on the, uh, the Zoom site. And we will take the questions at the end of the talk rather than during it. So, uh, without more ado, over to you, Rick. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mary. Very happy to see everyone today, to EC everyone at least. Natural history pastimes, like birders, like birding, are unique in the way that they participate simultaneously in two of the great categories of the hobby world. One is the category of the acquisition hobby, like collecting Studebakers or planting a hundred different varieties of iris. The other category is the information hobby in which what counts is expertise for its own sake, expertise, knowledge gathered about any subject imaginable, knowledge that is transmitted and stored as language. Birding has long been described as a form of collecting, a sublimation of our primitive instincts for the hunt, but our trophies are not rare stamps or medieval manuscripts or even not since the turn of the 20th century or so, not even skinned and mounted birds. So what is it that we're collecting? We collect words. Ours is a hobby of acquisition, gathering, collecting, organizing, and keeping. But the object of our eager desires is not a physical one, it's a word or rather to be more precise, it's a name, the correct name of the bird we've just encountered. Think about it, what do we do when we are birding and a flash of feathers flies up from our path? We speak the name of the bird out loud and you can admit it sometimes even when we're alone. We add the bird or rather we add the bird's name to a list, whether that's a paper checklist or simply the mental tally of our experiences and pleasures. That verbal act is an act of appropriation. There's a power to our speaking that gives us possession of the bird. Not long ago, we would have called that magic. The measure of the acquisitive hobbyist success, of course, is the extent of the collection. Whoever has the most salt and pepper shakers or Indian head pennies or bright red maple leaves pressed between the pages of a dictionary, that person wins. For us birders, it's not the birds that we carry home with us, but their names. And we measure our success by how many names we can speak correctly, or for diehard listers, how many names we have spoken correctly over the past. 
This peculiar emphasis on names as the object and the measure of our hobby explains why birders are so exercised about them. Unlike other natural history hobbies, ours is blessed or burdened with three different and only partially overlapping sets of bird names for us to learn and inevitably to argue about. The first set are what we can call popular names. These are the names that normal people, that is to say non-birders, apply to flighted creatures. Surely some of you, like me, grew up with a small lexicon of such folk names, some of them widespread, others geographically restricted. As a child in the 60s, I knew rain crows, I knew brown thrushes, I knew chimney bats, and I knew wild canaries. Sadly, for the historian and for the curious, many of those old names are disappearing, and new ones don't seem to be being coined. Um, excuse me, I just, um, I just got a message telling me that you can't see me. Uh, Mary, can you see the, the screen? Can you see my screen? We can see your screen. Yes, you're good now, Rick. Thank you. you. Cool. We can see you and the slides. It's great to see you. <laughs> okay, I, whatever. I can't see you, but I thought you were just doing the slides. Yeah, I am just doing the okay, slides. That's so right. Okay. All right. So we were at Wild Canaries. And the fact that um, many of these old names are disappearing and new ones aren't being made up. There's no reason to have a name, I suppose, for something that you never noticed. And the increasingly urban life list, most of us, Cali, gets by quite nicely with robin or pigeon or sparrow or blackbird or seagull. I, for one, can't remember when I last heard anyone call this bird a white brant. So that's one set of names. But birds also have scientific names, sometimes sloppily called Latin names. These are those famous binomials, two word names, more or less invented by Linnaeus and officially imposed on zoology and botany too over the course of the 19th century. We in North America tend to think of these names as awkward and fussy, something field guides throw in there in italics to look good. Over much of the world, though, birders actually learn and use these names unselfconsciously. They even use such intimidating names as Vireo and Phenopepla and Pyroloxia, even Junko, all of which are scientific names. These names ease communication in the field for traveling birders. If you're scoping geese with a friend in Denmark and happen to pick up this one, it's more efficient to say simply Chen Seri lessons than it is to try to figure out how to pronounce the name of the bird in Danish. Unlike any other group of organisms, birds have a third kind of name, an official English name promulgated in authoritative checklists that have been appearing now since 1886. These are the names that American birders invoke in the field. Yellow-billed cuckoo, brown thrasher, chimney swift, American goldfinch, and snow goose, the official English name of this species on the lists of the American Ornithologists, uh, Ornithological Society, the International Ornithological Congress, and all the rest of the authoritative checklists. You might think that this rich abundance of names would give birders something to celebrate, but look at what happens to words, look at what happens to names when they become both the object and the standard of a hobby suddenly they matter more than they would if, like normal everyday words, they simply referred to things. The names, though, are the things at the heart of our passion, and it's with considerable passion that we use them and think about them. It can't be any other way. If we happen for a moment to be not birding, we do the same as stamp collectors and rockhounds. We show off our treasures, our names, and we argue about our collections, our names. We don't necessarily argue with each other about names, but we do argue with the ghosts of those who came up with them. We can face it, 
Not every bird name, whether a popular name or a scientific name or an official English name, is as good as every other. And some of them are regularly denounced as just plain bad. We'll come back to the question of what makes a name bad, but let's have a look first at some of the standard standbys on the lists of worst bird names ever. There's no better bird to begin with than this one, a familiar species with popular scientific and official English names that just aren't really that good. The old hunter's name White Brant has been objected to on etymological grounds. The name Brant originally referred to the sooty or burnt color of the birds we still sometimes call black geese. White Brant, in other words, is a contradiction in terms, an oxymoron. It is at the intersection of the bird's official names, though, the scientific name and the authorized English names, that we run into a real absurdity. Snow goose sounds great for this snow white bird, but its scientific name brings us up short. Serialescens means blue. It's related to the English word cerulean. The two names, the official English name and the scientific name, are at cross purposes. One applies only to the white morph of the bird, the other applies only to the dark morph of the bird. And this is a situation decried by hobgoblins frustrated in their search for consistency. But like so many bad situations in the world of bird names, this one has a perfectly rational explanation. Some of us remember the days when the blue goose, the handsome slaty morph of the snow goose with the eagle white head and neck, was formally considered a distinct species. Though the presence of hybrids and integrates was well known, it was not until 1973 that the snow goose and the blue goose were lumped it was determined that they were, all, after all, simply different colors of a single species, but what to call the newly united birds. The official English name, it was decided, would be snow goose, probably because the white morph described by that name was the more widespread 45 years ago. But scientific names are not subject to argument, logical argument or not. They're governed by rules. One of those rules is that a priority, which states that the earliest properly published scientific name for a species takes precedence over all others. And it so happens that the first snow goose to be formally described and named in the scientific literature was a bird of the dark morph, a blue goose. And it was named by Linnaeus himself on the basis of specimens from Hudson Bay. It was not for another 11 years that the white bird was described under the perfectly sensible name Hyperborea, meaning high Arctic, but it was too late. This same situation where an official English name does not match the official scientific name is not uncommon. The ferruginous hawk, for example, has an English name or barely English, that word um, ferruginous, based on a scientific name, Falco ferruginius, but that scientific name was later discovered not to have chronological precedence. The bird had already been named Regalis, and that today, by virtue of priority, is its scientific name. In English, though, we're stuck with the mouthful ferruginous. Another example is provided again by the geese. One of the populations of the cackling goose goes by the English name Richardson goose. It honors the great Arctic explorer, John Richardson, who accompanied Franklin, and then after that led the search for Franklin's lost expedition. The oddity here though, is that the bird's scientific name does not refer to Richardson at all, but to John Hutchins, who was an administrator with the Hudson's Bay Company and in his spare time supplied European ornithologists with specimens from Canada. So Richardson's goose in English is Branta Hutchinsii, Hutchinson's goose, Hutchinson's goose in scientific ease. And the crowning irony of it all is that the name Hutchinsii, Hutchinses, was given to the goose by none other than John Richardson. Waterfowl, probably because of the very, very basic role that they play in so many human cultures, have especially complicated naming traditions. Blue-winged and cinnamon teal are leaving their breeding grounds right now. And when you see them on their way south, remember this bit and smile. The scientific name of the blue-winged teal, discourse, is inscrutable. These dapper little ducks are no more given to discord than any other. 
The scientific name of the cinnamon teal, in contrast, is all too easy to understand. Cyanoptera is composed of Greek roots that translate as blue and wing. In English, it's a cinnamon teal. In scientific terms, it's a blue wing. For most North American birders, most of the time, these clashes between the English and the Latinized names lurk far beneath the surface of our daily time of field. We direct most of our complaining instead at the English names themselves. And one such name, high on everyone's list of the all-time worst, is that we've given to the stunning and elegant, and some people say misnamed, ringneck duck. I'm sure I've done it myself, subconsciously correcting that odd name to ring-build. And there are serious efforts every once in a while to convince birders to simply start calling this bird with the rings on its bill, ring-build. But there's a reason it has been called ring-necked over the entire 200 years since it was first described to science. Bird species are described generally from specimens, dead animals generally lying on their backs in a drawer or a desktop. This is, in large part, for example, why we have the red-bellied woodpecker and the yellow-bellied sapsucker, two remarkably colorful birds with plumage marks of plenty on their upper surfaces, all of them more conspicuous in the field than a vague and usually hidden patch of color on the lower abdomen. And in truth, Though the purplish bronze ring around the neck of our duck is visible to best advantage when it's lying prone on a horizontal surface, you'd still think that the original describer of the species might have turned the poor bird over and been at least as impressed by the solid dark back or perhaps the conspicuous rings on the bill. What happened? The only way to answer questions like that is to go back to the sources to the actual book or paper in which the suspect name was first published. In the case of the duck, it was in the sixth volume of Edward Donovan's Natural History of British Birds, completed in 1819, more than 200 years ago. Tracking these sources down is worth it. For Donovan's attractive illustration of his newly described duck shows no rings on the bill. Donovan didn't overlook he didn't ignore what we think of as this species' most important field mark. It's just that that mark wasn't there. And his accompanying text gives us a pretty clear idea why not. Donovan tells us that he discovered his specimen in a butcher stall in London and that the bird had been shipped 160 miles from the river bottom where it had been shot. The duck was damaged. Its bill was badly shot or it was discolored in the unrefrigerated transit of the day or it had been painted dull, dark gray by a careless bird stuffer. In any event, the notion repeated for decades and decades now, the notion that Donovan was just stupid is just wrong. Returning to the sources reveals the good sense behind many of the names birders love to hate. The woodpecker names Downy and Harry, and these names for once reflect the scientific names, pubescens, Downy, Velosus, Harry. They're a stumbling block for many of us. The usual explanation is that hair is larger and coarser than down. That's true, and it's a neat way to remember which name goes with which woodpecker. But there is a real method behind this madness. When Mark Catesby handled his first specimens in the early 18th century, he observed that the back feathers of the smaller species were soft and lax, and that the same feathers on the larger species were stiff and bristle-like. It's not a difference of much practical use to the observer in the field, but it shows that these names and so many others were not the products of whim, caprice, or a misguided attempt at humor. Which is not to say that humor has never played a role in the naming of birds. There's a book crying out to be written about Linnaeus as a comic. Take what is generally agreed to be one of the most mysterious names he ever coined, the scientific of the name of the bird that I knew as a child as the chimney bat and that all of us today know as the chimney swift. Linnaeus never saw the bird, but he knew it like he knew the Downing and Harry Woodpeckers from the work of Catesby. For our purposes, what is important 
is that when Linnaeus got around to giving this species its official scientific name, he ignored every single one of the features that Catesby in his text described. The nesting habits, the perching posture, the strange spiny form of the tail feathers. No, Linnaeus instead gave it the name Pelagica, the seagoing swift. For 250 years, that name has given ornithologists, etymologists, and birders fits, and it's expired some outlandish explanations. But the answer, the true answer, is right there in the source, right there in Linnaeus' system of nature, tucked neatly away in a footnote. Linnaeus' book is about names. It's not about natural history, but every once in a while, at the bottom of the page, he shares with the reader a tidbit of natural history behavior. For the swifts and swallows, they were considered the same thing, basically, into the early 19th century. In the case of the swifts and swallows, Linnaeus informs us in this footnote that they eat their meals on the wing, that they fish for insects in the sky. They fish for insects. The name Pelagica, seagoing, for the common eastern swift is a mild joke. It's a witty comparison of the aerial to the oceanic. It just happens to be a joke that no one seems to have got since 1758. Linnaeus's humor could be less gentle. In the same year that he named the chimney swift, the great Swede also assigned a binomial to a huge white vulture from tropical America. This bird had been known to Europeans for decades, both as skins and as living specimens in zoos and private collections. Thanks to its gleaming plumage and exotically colorful head, it was a favorite subject of painters and porcelain manufacturers. And they always called it the king vulture, or its equivalent in the local language. Nothing would have been easier or more appropriate for Linnaeus than to simply translate that name into scientific Latin as Vultor Rex, the king vulture. He didn't. Rather than follow the lead, of all his predecessors and named the great bird Rex, the king, Linnaeus named it Papa, the Pope, thus creating another instance where a vernacular name and a scientific binomial conflict. Why? A little bit of history comes to our aid. In 1758, the Vatican placed Linnaeus's system of nature on the index of prohibited books a formal list of titles that the faithful were forbidden to read, and they were enjoined to commit those books to the flames should they come across a copy. It's not clear now why his work should have been condemned, but Linnaeus, who was the son of a Lutheran minister, fought back the best way he knew. Listen to his diagnosis of the bird he called the Pope. The Pope, he wrote, is a vulture whose nose is covered with warts and whose neck and crown are naked. The head and neck look as if they had been peeled, and they can be withdrawn into a sheath of down-covered skin on the lower neck. There's no need to explore these words any further beyond noting that they were not intended to flatter. In some other cases, it's hard to know whether Linnaeus was tweaking his reader's funny bone or simply accepting at face value the tales sent back by imaginative explorers. Birders in the American tropics often find fault with a couple of odd toucan names. The keel-billed toucan is suitably, if not distinctively, named in English, but its scientific name, coined by Linnaeus, comes across as unusual. He named it Pisivorus, the fish eater. This scientific name is usually dismissed as the garbled result of some unreconstructable confusion. But behind it lurks one of the great questions in early modern ornithology, the question of the function of the toucan's bill. Competing theories abounded in the 18th and 19th centuries about the way the bird used its monstrous appendage. Some thought it defended itself against intrusive monkeys. Some thought it hacked its nest holes. Some thought it cleaved a path through the foliage as the bird flew through the jungle. One of the most influential hypotheses dating all the way back to the 16th century was that toucans were actually a kind of waterfowl and their bills were specialized for capturing fish in rushing rivers. It's little wonder that Linnaeus named the bird the fish eater, a name that is inaccurate, a name that is wrong. 
but a name that takes us back to a time when the unknown was truly unknown. Even better, or even worse, is the name Linnaeus gave another toucan species, the Guyanan toucanet. He could have named it anything, for one of the splendid colors of its plumage, for its range in northeastern South America, for its sawtoothed blackened banana of a bill. But he assigned it the scientific name Piperivorous, the pepper eater, a name just as nonsensical, it seems, as the fish-eating toucans. But this name, too, leads us deep into toucan history. It was reported by some of the earliest European sources that toucans ate fruit and that they especially favored the fruits of a certain South American pepper plant. The story was elaborated, as stories usually are, and soon enough it was claimed that the seeds of that pepper could germinate only after passing through the gut of a toucan. That story still wasn't far-fetched enough. By the early 18th century, European explorers were reporting that the native people of South America shared the toucan's taste for the pepper, but that they wouldn't eat it until the toucan had digested and excreted it a process that rendered the seeds palatable to humans. Probably not true. It was more likely part of the early modern campaign to assert the primitiveness of the original inhabitants of the new European colonies. Linnaeus's name, silly as it seems, was part of a contemporary cultural program. In many other cases, European natural historians were straightforwardly misled by their informants in the Americas. The names of the palm warbler, both English and scientific, are a good example. Every spring and every fall, I listen to birders whine that they've never seen this bird in a palm tree. It breeds in northern bogs and it migrates along brushy field edges. And every year, I patiently suggest that they put themselves in the place of the 18th century scientists who coined the names and tell me whether they could have done any better. The first palm warblers to reach Europe came not from the Adirondacks or the boreal forests of Manitoba, but from the wintering grounds in the French Antilles. The colonists who sent the specimens back to France naturally encountered the birds in palms. And not being scientists themselves, they believed, and they passed on the natives' claims, that the birds spent the entire year on the islands where they bred in the palms. We know now that that last bit of information is not true. But what could one do in those long ago days before field guides and Google? What could one do but believe the people who were helping you? Palm Warbler may be, from our northern perspective, a misleading name, but it isn't wrong and it isn't bad. It recalls a chapter in the history of natural history that might otherwise have slipped the collective birding mind. Habitat names, such as Palm Warbler, are often singled out as especially unhelpful. Indeed, those of us who take these names too literally find pine warblers difficult to identify when they're not in pines, or we may go in search of prairie warblers in the tall grass of the Great Plains. Roger Torrey Peterson famously huffed that the field sparrow would be better called the pasture sparrow, obviously not understanding that field can mean more than just wheat or corn or oats. The American tree sparrow, too, is often said to be misnamed. It's not. They sometimes nest in trees on the edge of the tundra. But it turns out that this species isn't named for its habitat anyway. Instead, the name of our tree sparrow is rooted in a long ago scientific confusion in which our American bird was misidentified as the female of the quite different Eurasian tree sparrow. It's an indefensible error, but if it's indefensible, it's still an error that, if we think about it, illustrates how hard it is to start from scratch on an ornithologically new continent. Ornithologically new and unimaginably distant from Europe, too. The first American specimens to reach old world natural historians traveled over vast stretches of land and sea, and that was plenty of opportunity for specimens and their labels to be jumbled. The result was often that a species wound up with a name crediting it to an entirely different part of the world. Take the northern flicker. The spectacular woodpecker was so huge a range in North and Middle America. European science did not get its first glimpse of the western red shafted type until Captain Cook sent the first specimens back from southwestern Canada. Those skins were labeled as having been collected at the headland of Good Hope, which rises above the Bay of Good Hope in British Columbia. 
but the German scientist who described and named the flicker didn't understand. He read the tags as referring to the Cape of Good Hope in southernmost Africa. And that is why the scientific name of one subspecies of the red shafted flicker is Kaffir, an old and now um, distasteful word referring to non-Muslim Africans. But it went both ways. Many of you have birded Canada, and I bet none of you have ever seen a bird like this while visiting our neighbors to the north. This is the black crested ant shrike, a dramatic bird of tropical South America. And its scientific name is Canadensis, the Canadian. It was given that name in 1760 by a French ornithologist who described the species from a skin that he said had been secured in Canada. That's not likely, it's not even possible. The original label per, had perhaps become separated in transit, or the shipment had gone to France from South America by way of Quebec, or that scientist, normally sharp eye, had misread the word cayenne scribbled on the tag. In any event, this one bird and the story of its messed up name encapsulate a stage in the history of natural history, when American ornithology was a sort of triangle trade between metropolitan France and its colonies in South America, the Caribbean, and Canada. Thanks to the law of priority, we're stuck with the name Canadensis, but to change it to something more sensible would entail a loss of historical richness. Even accurate geographic names arouse the wrath of some. The Tennessee and Nashville warblers are no more common there than anywhere else, and Cape May warblers are decidedly scarce in southern New Jersey. Those names, Tennessee, Nashville, Cape May, aren't helpful if identification is your endpoint. But today, more than 200 years later, no one can see a Cape May warbler without thinking of Alexander Wilson's last expedition, when his companion discovered the warbler and Wilson almost lost his life, chasing a wounded oyster catcher into a riptide. One of the most straightforward of geographic bird names is linked to one of the most poignant stories in American ornithology. Andrew Jackson Grayson set out in the mid 19th century to become the Audubon of the West. Among the fruits of his labors on a visit to the island of Socorro was a new towhee, which Grayson named the Socorro towhee. That sounds unimaginative, Socorro Island, Socorro towhee. But Grayson went on to explain that Socorro in Spanish means aid, assistance, succor, and that he and his party were near death on the island when one of these towhees led them to the only source of fresh water. For Grayson, the towhee of Socorro was the towhee of mercy. And I think we owe it to Grayson and to the memory of his son who was murdered at the end of that expedition to think of the surprising connections between the birds and those who named them. Any day of the year, from Newburyport to Madeira, from Ding Darling to Denali, fights break out in burger bars over the appropriateness of bird names. Not long ago, there was a proposal before the Nomenclature Committee of the American Ornithological Society to change the English names of the tropical warblers, which we know as red starts, to white starts. The argument is that start means tail, and there's no red in the tail of these warblers, which instead have white tail feathers. Ergo, the name Red Start is wrong, and we'd better change it to White Start before the nomenclature of walls come a-tumbling down. Any undergraduate linguistics major would have no trouble demolishing that naive reasoning. Start hasn't meant tail in English for seven centuries, and the American Red Start itself was named not so much for the color of its tail as for its distant behavioral similarity to the Old World Red Starts. Beyond that, though, there's a fundamental philosophical matter to be raised. Names are not things. Names refer to things, they indicate things, they denote things, but they are not things themselves. There is no rational or logical or foreordained connection between the name and the thing. The system of reference, indication, denotation is entirely arbitrary, and names mean what they think what we think they mean only as a matter of convention. Tom, Dick, Harry, and Jane could as easily and as logically be called waffle iron, window pane, fence post, and soup. Red starts are called red starts not because there is any essential red startness to the word. Red starts are called red starts just because. Names are just names. They're just names. 
But as birders in the long tradition of American birding, names are all that we have. And sometimes names are enough. Wonderful, Rick. Thank you so much for that talk. That was absolutely fascinating. I learned absolutely loads, I have to say. You carefully didn't venture into the latest hot, to hot topic involving the likes of McCown's long spur, I noticed. <laughs> that's right. And I, I invited a lot of people to come with hard questions this afternoon. And that's one of the hard questions that I hope we can talk about. I'm sure it, I'm sure it will be. So, uh, yeah, let's open it now to any questions, please, from um, our attendees. If you have a question, you can raise your hand and we can, um, we can identify you in that way. Or we can start talking about McCown and his long spur. Yeah, let's talk about it. Oh, okay. we, do, we do have a question actually from Sally. Sally, we're asking you if you could please unmute your mic. Okay. There Hi. You Hi, Rick. How are you? Good. Uh, wow, awesome lecture. Um, yeah. Can you, I just was curious about um, the story about Wilson and the saving the, which, what bird with the flicker? He was, um, he was chasing an oyster catcher. An oyster catcher, that's it. Yeah, um, this was his last visit to South Jersey before, before he, um, before he died of hard work and dysentery. And he and George Ord were down in Cape May County, north of, of Cape Island. And um, Wilson wanted an oyster catcher specimen, so he shot one, but he didn't kill it. He wounded it. Oh. <laughs> and the bird took off out to sea. Wilson, wearing his heavy hunting clothes, carrying his gun, of course, went into the water to catch it. And um, the oyster catcher led him into a riptide, and he very nearly drowned. In some apocryphal accounts of Wilson's life, you can read that he did drown, that the oyster catcher killed him. <laughs> but it was, it was close enough. It was close enough. And it was on that same trip that Ord in, um, in a cedar swamp just north of Cape May discovered the warbler that would be called the Cape May warbler. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sally. Now we're going to go across to Dennis Parslow, who has a question for Rick. Okay. Over to you, Dennis. Oh, there we go. I was wondering how okay. to unmute. So you mentioned Kaffir as a name that is now uh, uh, insulting, at least for, for some people. Are there other names that come to mind that are, and we're not talking about the, the names like McCown, but, mm -hmm. but actual insults, you know, um, racial things or th that in, come to mind? In the world of official names, there aren't many left. Um, in scientific names, of course, because of priority, there are lots of birds with names that, um, that are, are not really suitable for the living room nowadays. But in English, um, another one is Hottentot. Um, Hottentot is an old European name for a, um, a group of people in South Africa who now call themselves... I think it's no, no. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't quite have it right. But they no longer call themselves Hottentot, and they think that they, they consider Hottentot an insult from the days of, of colonialist imperialism. And yet, in English, we still use the name Hottentot teal. And if I remember right, there's also a Hottentot button quail. Now, if you get into folk names or popular names, there's a lot. Right of names that are really quite, quite scurrilous. Okay, thank you, Great, Dennis. thank you. Now we're going over to Sam Somerville. Hi, Sam. What's your question, Sam? Hi there, I'm unmuted. Yes, yes. you are. Yes, hey folks, um, I thought this was an excellent talk and I was wondering, Rick, if you could uh, review or, or could identify again some of those primary sources used to I'm writing, illuminate the original scientific or common names, uh, where would one look? Um, there is a, a process and happily nowadays it's possible. Um, just 20 years ago it would not have been possible to do this kind of reading because the books are scattered all over the world 
and um, nobody wants to run to libraries on three continents just to figure out a, a bird's name. But nowadays, thanks especially to the Biodiversity Heritage Library, a great deal of these primary sources are available online for free. And I have the Biodiversity Heritage Library open all day. The best place to start um, is the Peters Checklist Birds of the World. And that is um, a checklist in 16 volumes. Um, volume one is two volumes. Volume 16 is the, um, the index volume. And that will tell you the original source for every bird name, every scientific bird name recognized at the time that the, um, that the checklist was concluded. So that's what I go to first usually, the, um, the Peters Checklist of Birds of the World. In addition to that, for North America, of course, there is the um, AOU, now the AOS, checklist of, of North American birds, also available for free online. And then you just start tracing citations back, 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 back. Um, sometimes you get stopped after a, a source or two, and sometimes it'll take you all the way back into the 16th century. Excellent, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Sam. At the moment, we've no, no more questions. So maybe um, if you could address, as I mentioned, the hot topic now of so many names which are uh, given to birds after a particular individual who is kind of coming out of favour now for whatever reason, um, slavery, confederacy, you name it. There's all sorts now. Yeah, um, there is a... Uh... There is a tradition in English-speaking ornithology to use both in the scientific names and in the formal English names, the names of people. These are so-called patronymic names. Um, Audubon's Oriole, McCown's Longspur, Brewer's Sparrow, Morton's Finch, and on and on and on. There are, someone told me, I think that there are something like 170 on the North American list alone, with a great many more all around the world. Two years ago, three years ago, a proposal was submitted to the NACC, the North American Checklist Committee of the American Ornithological Society, to change one of those names in English, the name of the McCown Longspur. Uh, McCown was, at the time when he first collected the Longspur and sent it east to Washington, to the Smithsonian, to Spencer Baird, um, he was a, um, an officer in the, the United States Army. And Baird, when he received this specimen, named it both in the scientific name and in the official English name for McCown. Someone then decided to figure out what McCown did after he collected the Longspur. And McCown joined the Army of the Confederacy in 1861 and fought against his country as a, as a traitor. In, um, in defense of the right to own other human beings as chattel and was highly decorated as a, um, as a, a soldier for the Confederate States of America. The argument is that this is not the kind of person we want to honor in a bird name. And that is a perfectly reasonable, perfectly cogent argument, though it does beg one question. It begs the question, are we really honoring people in birds names? Um, I, have, I have not quite decided that myself, whether naming a bird for a person really honors the person and his or her deeds in life. Um, the NACC rejected that proposal when it came up, I believe it was two years ago, rejected that proposal because they said that changing an English name for something like that would introduce instability into naming. And naming, of course, relies on stability. If you're going to communicate with someone, if I call a certain bird a blue-winged teal and you call it a cinnamon teal, to go back to one of the examples that, that I touched on in, in my remarks, we're not going to understand each other all that well, are we? Um, so stability is important. My view, though, is that stability is required and enforced in the scientific names. We can't take the scientific name McCownii away from that bird. It's just not, not permitted. But English names aren't subject to the same laws. They're not subject to the laws that intend to sustain the stability 
of the of the scientific tradition. And so there's no reason not to, in the case of the McCown Longspur, go back to some of the other book names. Um, Bay-winged Longspur, for example, has been known for almost 150 years now. And it's a perfectly good name, a perfectly descriptive name of, of a bird that, you know, deserves a, a good descriptive name. I don't see that it's much of a loss, and I suspect that it would be a bit of a gain. Now, this has all changed, of course, in the last year as we've become more and more aware of the enduring um, systemic racism in, in America and in all countries that, um, that, that had a colonial and imperialist system. And so all of these names are now under question. And there has sprung up a small cottage industry where people are doing everything that they can to dig up the unsanitary details of, of these people's lives. And they are finding stuff because a lot of these people, given that this, this was, after all, the heyday of colonialism and white supremacist thought, when most of these birds were first collected and named, most of these people belong to an elite that that abused other people. Um, Belding, for example, and Belding's first name is not coming to me right now. Um, he has quite a few birds named after him. He's got a sparrow, he's got a, a yellow throat. Belding um, spent a fair bit of time desecrating native tombs in Baja, California, so that he could ship the bodies back to museums in the US. That's not acceptable behavior. Audubon um, tells with considerable glee about going out to raid the graves of Indians along the Missouri River. Not acceptable behavior. And what it is coming down to is whether the NACC is going to recognize that stability in common names is, first of all, not really a thing. And second of all, that it is far less important, this notion of stability, than is a notion of inclusivity. And if, for example, you are a young, a young ornithologist from, from South Africa, my guess is that you're not going to want to study the Hottentot teal or the Hottentot button quail. And if your ancestors were held as slaves on a plantation in Tennessee in the early 19th century, you're probably not going to want to study the McCown Longspur. Um, that is that is where my views are right now. There are um, fairly powerful arguments. Well, there's one powerful argument on the other side, and that is, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, that names are not things. Um, these names really don't mean anything. If you take an extremely, uh, extremely extreme nominalist view of the way that that words work, the name McCown Longspur has no more meaning in it than would the number 1036912. You see, you could call the Longspur 1036912 and label all the plates in the field guide 1036912, and you'd still have a unique, um, a unique name for the bird. And the AOU in 1886 actually came out and said that in the, um, in the very long introductory matter to the first issue of their checklist. They said, names have no meaning outside the context of scientific ornithology. Which means that a name like McCann Longspur, if you take that seriously, does not in fact refer to Samuel P. McCown. I just remembered his names. Um, in fact, it is just a name for a bird. It has no biographical or historical um, meaning attached to it. I think that's, that's facile, but, but we'll see. Thank you, Rick. And of course, long spurs I know as buntings because I come from England. So it's all of those changes as well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Well, you mentioned the publications. Then, of course, the publishing company is doing very well out of name changes because then they have to reissue new editions. And of course, so many birders have to have the latest editions of all the books, <laughs> with the latest names, the latest taxonomy. So it does the publishers very well. Yes, um, they'll never catch up, which, which sees them laughing all the way to the bank, because as soon as the book comes out, it's, it's overdue, it's um, out of date. But I must say, um, I believe it was Bloomsbury the other day, and forgive me if it, if it wasn't Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury has become quite an important publisher on the, on the natural history scene. 
And um, one of the editors, I believe, um, spoke somewhere and said that even if official naming committees did not change their their attitudes to names and change the names, that it was quite possible that um, that Bloomsbury would simply develop a new house style book and call them things like Bay Winged Longspur. I thought that was very, very, very good, and and it's going to be an influential thing. If a, it will indeed, it will be very, very confusing for a lot of us. Indeed, I'm still struggling with Rivoli's versus Magnificent because they are magnificent. But uh, anyway, we have another question here from Patrick Bellardo. Hey, his... how are you? Hey, Rick, how you doing? Great, Good. great talk. Uh, just what, curious if you have any favorite lesser known colloquial names to share, like ones we may have never heard of. Oh, boy. Um, well, you've probably all heard all of the, um, all of the bitter names. Um, I like a lot of the names of the common Nighthawk. There's Pisk. Um, there is, um, there is of course, Night Swallow, um, Chimney Swallow. And um, one of them that mystified me for a while is Pork and Beans. <laughs> um, that is a genuine folk name for the common Nighthawk. And it has to do with the rather flatulent sound that, um, that common Nighthawks make in their swooping display flight. And so rather than calling it something distasteful, um, they, they're very, very modest and demure and say, that's the bird, pork and beans. I love it, thanks. Yeah. We have another question. And we have a question, where are the birder bars in New Jersey? Um, just about anywhere I go becomes a birder bar. Uh, Jillian, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> Probably the comment that I typed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, I'll step in. Actually, I'm her husband and I had I, typed in a question on her thing. Uh, you mentioned about not all names are given in honor of somebody. Mm -hmm. And the example I know of an acarologist, a guy working with ticks and mites, mm -hmm. had, had a bad breakup with his wife. Uh -huh. and he named a new species of tick after her on the basis of it being a blood-sucking parasite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not call yeah. that um, there, are, there are quite a few cases in the world of invertebrate naming. Um, I know that um, George W. Bush had some, some small and, and rather unpleasant invertebrates named for him. <laughs> I can't think offhand of any cases in birds Though um, Linnaeus calling the king vulture the Pope is mighty close. Yes. <laughs> it's quite plain that he, he was peeved by being put on the index of prohibited books. Yeah, there is a, a lot of free, free room there when, um, when you have been the first to describe an organism and have the right to name it. You can, you can do whatever you want. There are very, very few rules. And um, the notion that you shouldn't insult somebody is not among those rules. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Hi, this is Sam again. I have a question. Um, Rick, do you have a, a life bird or several that you still need to observe in the wild? Or, and then do you have any plans to check it or them off the list? <laughs> Uh, I don't I don't keep a life list, but I know every single bird that I've seen, and most importantly, I know every single bird that I have not seen. Um, a bird that I had hoped to be looking for right about now is one that for some reason has managed to elude me every single time I've been in middle America, and that is the russet crown motmot. I have never seen a russet crown motmot. -mot. Um, really upsets me just to think about it. And of course, there are lots and lots of other birds that I haven't seen. Um, that said, I've reached a stage after 45 years of birding that 
I certainly appreciate seeing a bird more and more and more. Um, I saw my first semi-palmated sandpiper in, I don't know, 1978 or something. And um, every summer this time of year, I go out and I, I look at the big flocks of semi-palmated sandpipers and I'm simply overwhelmed by how wonderful those birds are. So yeah, I'm always on the search for novelty, but I also look for the, the comfort and the, um, the delight that there is in, in running to a, an old friend like a semi-palmated sandpiper. Well, thank you very much, Rick. That's a fabulous talk. And thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. Yeah, I have to say that, yeah, I enjoy watching familiar things because I always see something different every time I watch them. And that's why backyard birding can be so good because yeah. you, you look closely enough, you see something new. So, um, yeah, thanks again. And all of you will be pleased to know that this talk has been recorded and will be available for two weeks um, via Zoom. So anyone who wasn't able to, uh, to get into, into to, to this session, we can pass the details on to them and they can watch it. Okay. Um, our next talk is going to be on Wednesday, August the 26th. This will be Mike Foster talking to us about the edible native plants of southeastern Arizona. And uh, in the meantime, if you haven't already done so, you might like to go to the Southwest Wings website, which is www. Um, swwings.org where we have a fabulous 22 minute film available of the wildlife of the southeast Arizona area. It really is a delight and something which all of you who weren't able to come down to do one of the field trips here can relive perhaps something of the past and get something to, to enjoy from it. So um, thank you very much again thanks to Rick, thanks thank to you, everyone man. for attending and we look forward to um, seeing you all at our next session in a month's time. Everybody Thanks take everyone. care, stay well. Thank Thanks. you so much, Rick. It was Thank wonderful. you very much. Thank yes. you. Bye. Bye. Well.